Good morning and welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 11th of December and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 14th of December and it's been another record-breaking week for US equity markets. We've seen new record highs in the Nasdaq and the S&P 500 albeit they've been marginal record highs. There does appear to be an element of failing momentum when it comes to further upside for US markets. We've seen the debut of two IPOs this week in the form of DoorDash and Airbnb, who's, who saw an opening price bounce of 113% on the first day of trading, um, giving it a remarkable and absolutely staggering market capitalization of $86 billion for a company that actually hasn't made a profit yet. And it actually puts it as double the size of the big US hotel chain Marriott, um, which is even more amazing. Um, so um, we have we have the we have the spectacle of a couple of IPOs or one IPO in particular being bigger than the high in the in pretty much the entire global hotel industry. Um, so putting that incredulity to one side, um, looking at the week ahead it's it's a it's a big week for central banks once again we've just come off the back of the european central bank and we've also come off the back of a significant deterioration in eu uk trade talks to the point now that it's becoming increasingly likely that we could get a no deal outcome um nonetheless european stocks and us stock markets in general are I'm pretty much taking it in their stride, as is the pound, really, when you consider that um, now that we have a new deadline on Sunday, um, the likelihood of a no deal outcome is probably now, I would suggest, the more probable outcome, certainly on the basis of a 50-50, certainly, certainly a much higher percentage than was the case, say, for example, a week ago. I think most people are operating on the basis that pragmatism will win out and that neither side will look at the risks of going down the no deal route yet here we are with around about three weeks to go and we've got the spectacle of ursula von der Leyen, president of the european commission outlining plans for no deal on the 1st of january 2021 on the flip side of that we've also got prime minister boris johnson also um, preparing the UK for the prospect of a no deal outcome. And whichever side of the whichever side of the um, fence you are with respect to this, whether you voted leave or whether you voted to remain, the fact that we're in this situation now, and the Prime Minister has said that it would be a failure of statecraft if there was no deal, it takes two people, two sides to make a deal. And it would be a failure of statecraft on both sides if no deal were to happen. And certainly, when you look at it through that prism, it does appear that the EU is expecting to exact a much more significant price for its relationship with the United Kingdom than it would with any other counterparty. And that's even with the risks of the damage a no deal outcome could do, not only to the UK economy, and on whichever whichever side of the fence you sit on with respect to damage to respective economies, you know you're basically you're not comparing like with like. You know there will be there will be damage not only to the UK economy, but there'll be significant damage to the French economy, to the German economy, to the Spanish economy. We're looking at coronavirus cases that are continuing to rise. Yes, we've got a vaccine rollout so starting this month in the UK hasn't even started in the European Union. And we've got the prospect of further restrictions in France um, until the beginning of next year, and actually until the middle of January in some cases. So the economic damage that is being done as a result of the pandemic is likely to be colossal. And yet here we have two sides that appear completely um, indifferent to that prospect and going down a no deal outcome route.
Now, of course, it could just all be noise, um, but looking at the differences of opinion or the differences between the respective sides' positions, there's going to have to be a significant shifting um, from the gaps as they are now to some form of deal as we head into the end of the year. And certainly, I think a six month contingency is eminently sensible, as outlined by the EU in a statement earlier this week. As far as markets are concerned, there doesn't really to be there doesn't really appear to be that much of a worry. Um, if we look at if we look at the, the if we look at the value of the pound, for example, if you talked about a no deal outcome, even as recently as the beginning of this year, you certainly wouldn't get the reaction that you're getting now. Year to date, the pound is pretty much back where it started. It's around about 132. Um, and that's before, obviously, the passing of the withdrawal agreement at the end of January in the UK Parliament. This is the COVID dump here, all the way from 130, all the, 132, all the way down to 115, 114 and a half. Since then, we've gone pretty much one way. Now, a large part of that has been as a result of dollar weakness, but we're still going to have to fall an awful lot more to undermine the down, the uptrend rather, the uptrend that's been in place since these May lows all the way back on the 20th of May here. So, and there's also a counterfactual in place here. If there's damage to the UK economy, there will also be significant damage to the European economy. And one part of the reason why the pound is so weak this morning is also that Andrew Bailey, governor of the Bank of England, has once again um, trotted out the line that the bank is considering. The Bank of England is still considering the prospect of negative rates. And the pound generally doesn't like that sort of narrative. And we've got a Bank of England rate meeting coming up next week, the last one of 2020. And um, we could well get further colour on that particular discussion. I'm still of the opinion, given the fact that we've just seen an, an, another increase in stimulus in November of 150 billion pounds, I'm still of the opinion that there are significant divisions on the MPC about the efficacy or otherwise of negative rates. Certainly the UK banking system is probably, or the financial system rather, is not particularly well suited to negative rates. And ultimately, if the bank was thinking of going down the negative rate route, why would they have green lighted um, UK banks to start the resumption of their dividends. Ultimately, if capital preservation um, and concern about um, falling margins is at the forefront of any thinking, and obviously you've got a no deal Brexit coming up as well, why would the Bank of England potentially give the green light to the banks to start paying dividends again? There's, there's, something, not, there's something that doesn't really sit right in those two pronouncements, those two announcements. You've got on the one hand, the Bank of England saying, yes, yeah, okay to restart dividends, just as we're heading towards the end of December and the prospect of a no deal. So I would suspect the only deadline that matters is the one at the end of this month. And that we could, even at this late stage, find that even without a no, even with a no deal, there will be an awful lot of mitigating circumstances brought to bear, which should cushion the outcome if that is indeed what turns out to be the case as we head towards year end. So that's, that's essentially where we are with respect to Brexit and the pound. Um, we've also got UK retail sales out next week as well. And certainly I think there we've seen a significant rebound in, um, the, in the UK consumer. It's actually been fairly resilient since the lockdown in April, April retail sales, we've seen six consecutive months of decent gains. We saw a 1.2% gain in October. That was well above expectations. Now, obviously, November, we've had the English lockdown. We've had a whole host of tighter restrictions north of the border and obviously in Wales as well. Um, and the lockdown did come into effect on the 5th of November. So I think one of the reasons why October did so well was due to a pull forward effect with respect to the November numbers. 
Um, and as such, we'll probably see a significant slowdown and a possible contraction in retail sales in November. Now, there are a couple of mitigating circumstances here. The lockdown that we saw in November was by no means as onerous as the one that we saw in April. So it's unlikely that the numbers will be worse. Furthermore, the most recent British Retail Consortium Retail Sales Monitor was actually better than expected. Now, this might suggest that despite the lockdowns closing bars, restaurants, which saw a 50% decline in spending in those particular sectors, could have well have been offset by a 47% boom in online sales, which helped to compensate in those BRC numbers. So sales of electronic items like the, the new Xbox X, the PlayStation 5, games and what have you, could actually mitigate the number that we see for November in terms of retail sales. Now that we've seen an opening in December, you could actually see some of that bounce back in the December numbers now that um, the UK is either under tier two or tier three restrictions. So, you know, that's, that's, those are the key UK items that I have my eye on over the course of the next few days. But certainly in the context of where we are at the moment, despite the declines of the past couple of days in cable here and here, we're still above the 50 day moving average. We're still above 131.80 um, and we're still well above this trend line from the lows here, which comes in around about 129 and a half. So we've still got potential to fall quite a bit more without undermining the potential for a move back towards 135 and all the way up to 140 next year, which continues to be my main base case if you take all the headline risk out of the equation. Because ultimately, when I look at a chart, my primary focus is what is the price doing? What is the price action telling me? The price action is telling me here that we're in an uptrend. And until such times as we break out of that uptrend, my, my trading bias will always be to trade what you see, not what you hear. Because some of the biggest mistakes in trading are based on what you hear and not what you see. So for me, it's important to trade what you see and not what you hear. So looking at cable at the moment, we're under, undergoing a little bit of sterling weakness and that could well see um, the prospect of further losses over the course of the next few days. Certainly, we're going to see an awful lot of volatility. That isn't going to change. But overall, I still remain constructive on the pound against the dollar. Probably less so against Euro sterling. We've broken above that trend line resistance there. Found solid support now at 89.80. And we've broken above the 90.80 here and could well head back towards these peaks here all the way back at 93. Now, one of the reasons why we saw this breakout was obviously there was a, a little bit of disappointment around um, the ECB rate meeting yesterday and the outcome of that. Just as a quick recap, the European Central Bank expanded its PEP program by another 500 billion euros. They extended it to March 2022. That's welcome, but it's still the equivalent of pushing on a string. And while the obstacles to the passing of the latest EU budget, 1.8 trillion euros, are welcome, the EU, st the EU still needs to do a lot more on the fiscal side to even get close to an effective response to the current problems that are afflicting the various economies. You know, and that's a very, very key factor. We've also got the latest flash PMIs for December out next week as well. And they are due out um, in the middle of the week. And they're unlikely to show any significant improvement to the poor numbers that we saw in November. And that illustrates starkly the problem facing the ECB at the moment. Um, the shutdowns, the restrictions, the rising infection rates, not only in Germany and France, but pretty much across the whole of the Euro area. The whole services sector in Germany is, is in contraction and significantly so, particularly in France, where the services sector is actually 
saw a slide to 38.8 in November, down sharply from 46.5. And it's likely to remain mired in contraction, not only in December, but in January as well, because pubs and bars and restaurants will still be closed in France until the 20th of January. So you're not really get, I'm not expecting to see a significant improvement there either. That being said, the rise in the euro is not helping. It's, in, it's in, introducing a deflationary bias into the eurozone economy. And it's also making eurozone exports much more expensive. So the recovery that we're seeing in China is going to hinder German exporters. Um, and that is likely to affect um, the, the Germ German company's earnings. And that's probably why you're seeing the DAX starting to struggle at anywhere near the levels that we've seen over the course of the past few days. So Euro sterling could well go back towards 92, 93 and the highs that we saw in September. And that's probably why we're seeing the DAX now start to roll over. Um, simply, there's a perception perhaps that the lack of a deal is now starting to focus minds on the potential for significant damage to the European economy, let alone the European economy. Um, and we've, as a result, we've seen the DAX start to roll over quite sharply. It's been trading in a fairly boring range for quite some time. We've broken below 13,200. We could well fall quite a bit further from here, all the way back to maybe 12,800, because we haven't been able to make any headway whatsoever near the top end of the range. FTSE 100, on the other hand, is actually trading quite nicely. Um, made new highs earlier this week, nine month highs, highest level since March. We've started to roll back. If we fall back below 6,500, we could slip back a little bit further. Um, but I think the weakness of the pound, if it continues, should help in that regard. But certainly the rally that we've seen from the lows in October has been mightily impressive. And we're now back at levels that we last saw prior to the lockdown. So I'm fairly constructive on the FTSE 100, but I think that doesn't mean that we can't slip back all the way back to 6,400 in the short term. But we need to see how we behave above 6,500 and these lows that we saw at the beginning of this week around about 6,500 on Monday and Tuesday. Looking at the S&P, again, new record highs. But again, we're starting to roll over here. Talk of a US stimulus deal, never gets old, that one. Um, at some point, though, I think the US is going to have to, or US politicians are going to have to start becoming less partisan and more collegiate. Because weekly jobless claims this week jumped from 716,000 to 853. That's a big, big jump. And that suggests that the lack of new stimulus is now starting to have a chilling effect on the US economy. And let's not forget that the existing stimulus package of CARES Act benefits rolls off at the end of this month. So if this, if the weekly jobless claims number that we saw this week doesn't concentrate the mind, maybe the one coming up next week will, because if we see a continued rise. Um, of the kind that we saw this week, then I think the impetus is there. I think this is one stimulus deal that could eventually get passed, albeit it could be at the very last minute. But certainly I think um, US markets are starting to get a little bit twitchy after making those new record highs at 3,700 earlier this week. Similar sort of story on the NASDAQ, a big, big plunge there. I'm seeing a little bit of a rebound, but we're starting to get an awful lot more chatter now about the prospect that, you know, are we in a tech bubble? Are we this? Are we that? Look, we, we're still we're still in an uptrend when it comes to equity markets. Let's stop trying to call the top because we've been trying to call the top for the past 12 months. And thus far, we have failed abysmally. Um, so at the moment, I think it's very much a case of buy the dips. It will continue to be a case of buy the dips. We're back and below this 12,450 level here. Um, we need to hold below that if we're to continue 
the move lower back down towards 12,000 on the NASDAQ. So certainly, certainly keeping an eye on that. So as we head into, it's going to be a big meeting. Federal Reserve talked about it a little bit earlier. I haven't really gone into too much detail about it, but I certainly think a, a good outcome, and we've seen a weak dollar, um, a good outcome would be a stimulus deal and a Federal Reserve meeting that um, really, I think, guides to the fact that they will remain very accommodative going forward. And certainly, I think that has been the case over the course of the past few weeks. The Federal Reserve has said it's going to keep, rate loads, keep rates low all the way through 2023, 2024. They could potentially extend that guidance out even further. Fed officials have been very vocal about the prospect of fiscal stimulus. And certainly, I think the new relationship um, between the new US Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen, who knows a fair bit about the Federal Reserve, given the fact that uh, Jerome Powell replaced her, um, there could be a very significantly different relationship between the Federal Reserve and the US Treasury going forward. So I think now that we're pretty much over the, um, over the line when it comes to a Biden administration, um, the, 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 the dovetailing, the, the um, consensus between the US Federal Reserve and the US Treasury is likely to mean that the US dollar has the potential to weaken quite a bit more than it already has done. Let's look at the CMC dollar index for a start. When we look at this here, um, we traded broadly sideways this week, but it's certainly significant that we struggled to really rally with any significant um, with any significant momentum. And if we look at euro dollar and the way that's behaved this week, there is fairly decent support in and around 12050, 12020. Also, this this peak here, there's a peak here. This one here on the second of second of September was was around about 12010 there. So you pull that across there. So 120 between 120 20 and 12070 is going to be a significant area of support. Also, if we if we do a Fibonacci projection of this breakout move here, which I've identified as a triangular consolidation, then a the minimum price objective continues to be 122.30. So I think while we're above 120 and a half, there or thereabouts, I'm still of the opinion the euro dollar goes to 125 over the course of the next few weeks. That hasn't changed and that won't change while we remain in this sideways consolidation here. So decent resistance around about 121.70. Broader resistance is at 122.30, which is my minimum price objective while above 120. Um, and the only way that I would basically change that opinion is if we drop back below 120. You react to the price action, not to the noise coming out of the various news wires. Um, so going forward, while above 120, the, 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 the move to 125 still remains on the table by way of 122.30. Um, so that's euro dollar. So the bias remains to the upside for euro dollar. I'm still of the opinion the bias remains to the upside for cable though we might see a little bit of a dip first. Um, keeping a quick look on Brent crude, um, just a quick look at that. I wanted to show you this because I think it was significant that for all the declines and the volatility that we've seen in Brent crude this year, this is the peak that we saw beginning of January. This is the low that we saw in April. We've retraced 61.8% of that move higher. At 50, 65. So how Brent crude behaves over the course of the next few days will dictate where we go to next. But certainly there is significant there is a significant barrier anywhere near 50 dollars and sixty cents and fifty one dollars a barrel. So I'll be keeping a particular close eye on Brent crude over the course 
of the next few days. Other data, other data to keep an eye out for next week is obviously the latest UK unemployment numbers. Talked about them in the past. Quickly look at the CMC Sterling Index. Um, we've just about maintained the uptrend in that. Obviously, the pound has sunk against the euro quite a bit this week. Quickly look at that there. Um, that line looks as if it's just about hanging on, but we've also got a series of lows all the way through here. So those lows there through here could also be significant in the short to medium term. So it's worth keeping an eye on those lows there um, for any break towards the downside. So on, uh, in terms of the unemployment levels, um, we've already seen a move to 4.8% in September. This will be the three months to October. So it's going to be slightly backward looking. But if we see a move towards 5%, um, it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. And it certainly wouldn't surprise me to see it move above that over the course of the next few months. But if you cast your mind back to 2014, 2015, when Mark Carney was governor of the Bank of England, he said he would look at raising interest rates when the unemployment fell below 7%. How long ago that seems now. Um, so that's um, the key things that I'm keeping an eye out for this week. We've also got a couple of an earnings, earnings announcements. We've got Dixon's car phone, the first half numbers for 2021, which are due on the 16th of December. Again, another retailer that been, that's been hit hard by the store shutdowns in the spring. They posted a 50%, 51% fall in four-year profits in the summer, but they've enjoyed a fairly decent rebound over the course of the last few months. Um, and despite the falls that we've seen in the last few days, um, not really unexpected, we can draw a nice little trend line through that. Here we go, let's just do that now. And that goes there we go. So we're still in an uptrend on Dixon's car phone. You can slip back down all the way back to 100p in the short to medium term without undermining the uptrend that we've been in since the rebound of the March lows. So um, a good creep, a good pre-Christmas period here, news about a vaccine. I think that's likely to give an uplift to general retail to retail in general. So I'm not overly concerned about a little bit of a sell-off there. And we've also got the latest numbers out of the US from Federal Express. Plenty of room for disappointment there, given the fact the shares are at all-time highs. Um, parcels and logistic companies are generally a good barometer of the overall economy. This chart doesn't really look that much different from any other US retailer like Walmart or Target, they've done very, very well over the course of the past few months. Revenues have been fairly solid for, for FedEx. Profits came in at $4.87 a share in Q1. I think they'll struggle to beat that particular number in Q2 um, with an expectation of around about $3.79 a share uh, on revenues of around about $18 or $19 billion. But again, here, um, starting to look a little bit frothy on the top side. Okay, so um, summing up, um, the key things to keep an eye out for over the course of the next few days are, in summary, Federal Reserve, US stimulus plan, will they, won't they? I think there's a good chance they will. Um, Bank of England, and in the words of Noel Edmonds, deal or no deal when it comes to a UK Brexit announcement. So that's it for this week. From me, Michael Hewson, thank you very much for listening. Um, have a great weekend. And if I don't speak to you before, have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.